Good morning, church family. I'm friends with each and every one of you, but I may not be friends with you on Facebook, and that's not because I've chosen not to. It's just I don't always keep up with, uh, with that. But um, I just need to give out a formal announcement to each one of you, some personal things that are happening on our life. Now, some of you may know, some of you may not know, but um, there has been discovered in uh, my wife's lower abdomen region a growth that is taking place, and it has arms and legs and a heartbeat and a brain. We saw that this week. And... um, I just wanted to let you know that my wife hasn't been forsaking the assemblings of ourselves, but she's been crook for the last three months. But uh, she's starting to be on the upward climb, and um, we're really excited and looking forward to uh, welcoming our third child. So, um, so thank you for your patience that, uh, and support, those that have uh, given us support through this time, and, um, and for being understanding when my wife hasn't been able to be here too, but uh, we're grateful that she's here this morning. Hey, honey? So, just wanted to put that out in front, and yes, it was a planned, uh, planned birth or pregnancy, so that was, those were the questions. I just wanted to put that out there. We're all family here, so we need to just let you know, and don't have to be weird or awkward about this anymore, so carry on. It's been an exciting week and a tough week for many people in New Zealand, And um, have you seen God's hand working in your life this week? Have you been able to be a part of God's um, workings in the world around you? Have you seen God work through you and around you? I had an interesting experience this week where I had pulled into a parking lot that had a funny little intersection that most crosswalks in parking lots have... uh, that wheelchair access going down onto the street, but this one did not. It was just a curb in the street and the the street curb on the other side. And as I was coming in, I waited patiently as this elderly couple was crossing the parking lot. And um, the missus got over and up onto the curb with her little stroller, and the mister was carrying the, the bag. And as he stepped up, he just fell straight back and sprawled across the ground right in front of my car. And, you know, providentially, I wasn't actually intending to go into this particular parking lot, but I had a feeling I needed to go back there, and and I I realized why. And it was uh, uh, for this situation. And I was able to hop out of my car quickly, and it was amazing how the public just raced to help. People from everywhere were jumping out of their cars, and we helped this man to his feet. And they said, where are you going? And it was a, a, a three or four block walk home, this elderly couple, and this man could hardly stand. And I said, get in my car. And we're able to assist him and get them home. And, and the, uh, we need to be patient with the elderly people. And, and those that are old... Be patient with yourselves, too. I know you can get frustrated that, uh, you know, your body may not be keeping up as it should, and you, you, things aren't as it were. And this, uh, this wife, she was chastening, chastening her husband all the way home. You, you need to be more careful. You need to stand on your feet. And I said, it's okay. It happens. And I was able to give them a ride home and to, to take that burden um, that, that long walk home for them. It feels good to be a part and to be useful. And, um, and I just think it's important to pray and to look for opportunities where we can step in and to be that helping hand in those, those unique cases. Um, and sometimes it can be inconvenient and sometimes it can even take up some of our time. But the, the blessing of sharing and loving on people, it outweighs the loss of time or even money. So that was a blessing to be a part of and to help that dear couple this week. As we begin our our Bible study this morning, I want to offer up one more word of prayer. I feel like I need uh, the Lord in a a special way this morning as we dig into God's word. So 
Please just bow your heads with me as we seek the Lord once more. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful to be here in your house. And you're the reason why we're here. So we're wanting to meet with you. So I ask, Lord, as we study from the Word of God today, that you will speak to each of our lives. Lord, that you will train my lisping and stammering tongue to speak your words, and that your name may be lifted up, and that your love may be expressed in a powerful and clear, undiluted tone, that it may bring inspiration into our life, but bring transformation as well. And we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. This morning we're going to be taking a story out of John chapter 7 and in verse and chapter 8. So if you have your Bibles, follow along with me in John chapter 7. Now Jesus had gone up to Jerusalem to, I believe, take part in the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, and the Jews knew that he was coming and they were keeping an eye out for him, the Pharisees at least. And they were wanting to catch him out and they were wanting to, to kill him. Um, because they could see that he was gaining more and more influence and was drawing um, their attention away from themselves and to, to himself. And so they had set up spies. They had set up methods in which to capture Jesus. And in John chapter 7, in verse 32, the Pharisees, this, it goes like this. It says, The Pharisees heard the crowd murmuring these things concerning Jesus, and the Pharisees and the chief priests sent officers to take him. And it's such an interesting story that these, you know, I can picture these big burly temple guards being sent off. We'll call them Mick and Mash. There's more, bro more bronze than there are brain. And these men, they just answer with a grunt and they take off to, to fulfill their, their task of capturing Jesus. And as they're scouring through the temple looking for Jesus, the words fall upon their ears in verse 37. If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. And he who believes in me, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. These are things that he, they have never heard before, mick and mash. And this is not the type of... of of, of counsel and scriptural guidance that the Pharisees would have given. And they're stunned by it. And as they sit there and soak in the presence of Jesus, it's almost like they forget the task that was at hand and what they were sent there to do. And, and they come back and they stumble back into the presence of the, the chief priests in verse 45. Then the officers came to the chief priests and the Pharisees who had said to them, why have you not brought him? We sent you to get him. Why did you not bring him back? And the officers answered and said, No man ever spoke like this man. The words that Jesus spoke, it had a resounding impact in these, these men's life. And their task, they, they disobeyed their orders. And those words began to resonate in their life and it was bringing almost an immediate transformation. It says, Then the Pharisees answered and said, Are you deceived? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? In other words, guys, we have the brains, you have the brawn. We haven't listened to Jesus, neither should you. Now, I think we need to be very careful if there's anyone that is ever counseling us to regard their word over Jesus' word. To regard what they say over what the Bible says. To hold to tradition rather than holding to the counsel of thus saith the Lord. And they're saying, listen guys, we have the brains, you have the brawn. You should have, you should have listened to us. In verse 49, but this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. In other words... They haven't studied the scriptures themselves. They don't understand it. They're going to be accursed because of their ignorance. But Nicodemus stands up and he says, he who came to Jesus by night, being one of them, he said to them, 
Does our law judge a man before it hears him and knows what he is doing? And they answered and said to him, Are you also from Galilee? Search and look, for no prophet has risen out of, out of Galilee. Now we've talked about Nicodemus before, and I'm not going to bring up too much of him right now. But they were so blinded, these Pharisees, by their personal opinions and personal agendas that they were unwilling to hear the truth, that they were unwilling to even recognize and to search the scriptures in the context of, could this be the Messiah? Could this be the Christ that the prophets had spoken of of old? And they said, has a prophet ever come from Galilee? Well, actually, yes. Prophets had come from Galilee before. And actually, 60 years later, in 90 AD, there was a, uh, a, a rabbi that said, there isn't a tribe in all of Israel that a prophet has not come from. But they were trying to, to, to blank, make this blanket statement, this is impossible. Could a prophet even come from Galilee? If you look in the book of 2 Kings, chapter 14, you'll recognize a prophet that, uh, that has an interesting story, but it, it gives us some details of where he's from. 2 Kings chapter 14. And verse 25. This is giving the accounts of the, the, the kings and how they conquered and expanded their territories and lands. But it gives us a unique little detail here. It says, And he restored the territory of Israel from the entrance of Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord God of Israel, which had spoken through his servant Jonah, the son of Amittai, the prophet who is from gath Hefer. Now, if you look in your maps and you look in the historical records, we can see that Jonah from Gath of Hefer was from the land of Zebulon, which was Galilee, to be exact. So it's interesting that these Pharisees, they were unwilling to look at the truth. You know, you ever heard that saying, don't let the truth get in the way of a good story? Don't want to let the truth get in the way of their opinions and their biases that they'd already made about Jesus. And Jonah was not the only one. Some scholars believe that even the prophet Nahum was from the region of Galilee as well. Anyways, they finish their discussion, and it says in verse 53, we're back in John chapter 7, and it says in verse 53, and everyone went to his own house. And starting in with verse 1 of chapter 8, it says, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now, I find this interesting. Jesus had spent a day in the temple kind of silently and quietly avoiding uh, people really trying to kill him but all the while loving and teaching and blessing people. And he, you might in some respects, have had a stressful day. Where everyone else heads back to their home, just says that Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. And this, as we study in Scripture, seems to be a place that he often retired to and that he would often go there to pray. Now, I was thinking about this this morning that you know, trying to put my place, myself in the place of Christ here in this story of having gone through a, a tough day. Have any of you ever had a tough day? A day where maybe you've been misunderstood, maybe even falsely accused. Maybe you've been stressed. Maybe you've been annoyed. How do you deal with that? What do you do? You know, we all have different coping mechanisms. Some of their drug of choice. Some... They go to the toilet. And what I mean by that, and I witnessed this in high school, where if a group of girls would get, or at least one girl would be upset, they would go in a pack, a herd of them, and they would go to the toilet. And they would have this, I don't know what they did in there, but they would like, you know, you could hear them, and they were talking it out, right? You know, we have different ways of coping with stress. Some people go to social media to express their viewpoints. Some people, they start texting or calling a friend, and they have a rant and a rave, and... I'm guilty of all of these, right? But Jesus, having a stressful day, he goes to a 
secluded place to the Mount of Olives. And I know, I know he went there and he went there to pray. And yes, when we are going through stressful times and going through moments of uncertainty, it's important to have counsel from friends and to go and to talk to them. But why not follow the example of Christ first and let's talk to our Heavenly Father. Amen? He went to a quiet place up on the Mount of Olives. And it says, now early in the morning in verse 2, that he came again into the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and he taught them. Then the scribes and the Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery and in the very act. Now Moses, in the law, commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? Now, they're trying to catch Jesus out here. They're trying to test him. They're trying to tempt him. They're trying to catch him off guard to find some reason that they can openly kill him. Now, Jesus is very clever in how he responds and the way he actually doesn't respond. Is that if he had responded, well, yes, she should be stoned, then he would be usurping the law of the land and they would be usurping the, the authority of the Roman Empire, and he could have been brought to justice, so to speak, on that grounds. But if they said, no, she shouldn't be stoned, then he would be disregarding the Old Testament commands and laws of the Torah, that there was clear guidelines that uh, a woman or a, and a man, by the way, if they were caught in such an act, they were to be put to death. And so they were cleverly trying to catch Jesus out, but he doesn't bite. You know, it's interesting that they bring this woman in that was caught in adultery, and I was reflecting on that and that thought this week, that how many of us, now, not necessarily so to speak, maybe you've never been caught with your hand in the cookie jar and I'm not necessarily talking about adultery right here at the moment, but what I'm saying is, how many of us are caught in sin? And not the type of sin that it's a kind of a, oh, that was a mistake, but have you experienced that habitual sin that day in and day out you're struggling with it and you can't seem to grow past it, you can't seem to go beyond it, and it's just always there? This woman... Yes, she was caught in the act, but I leave that she was also caught there. And the only way she, she could gather, gain freedom was by being brought into the presence of Jesus. You know, if you are in that state right now, I invite you, I encourage you, keep throwing yourself at the feet of Jesus. Don't be discouraged that you've been and you've recited these prayers so often before Keep coming to Jesus. Because just as this woman, as we're going to see that he brings healing into her life and many more times in the future, Jesus can bring healing in your life too. So they try to catch out Jesus. And it says in verse 6, they said this, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear. A lot of people try to question and wonder, what, what was he writing? He didn't respond. But it becomes quite obvious what Jesus was writing. So it says, so they continued in verse 7, and they asked him, and he raised himself up and he says, he who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her feet. Now this was the woman's sentence, so to speak. It was her death sentence. She was expecting to be having a, a, a shower of rocks to fall upon her. But it says, and again, he stooped down and he wrote in the ground. And those who heard it, being convicted of their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone with the woman standing in the midst. These men that had brought this woman 
with really some contemptible charges, charges that maybe not have been able to prove or to withstand in court. They weren't even following protocol of law written in the, in the book of Moses. That they were, there was the husband that was to bring the woman to the court, not these men. And they broke protocol, they broke the law themselves in trying to catch Jesus out. And I believe Jesus was writing down their past mistakes and their past failures as well. And he says, he who is without sin cast the first stone. And none of them could cast it. None of them could throw it. They were coming to convict this woman to death, but they walked away being convicted themselves. You ever heard that saying that when you point the finger at someone else, there's three fingers pointing back at you? <laughs> and so it was with these guys, and they walk away utterly humiliated. And this is where it gets beautiful. It says in verse 10, but Jesus has raised himself up, and he saw that no one but the woman, and he said to her, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? And she said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. You know, the Pharisees were quite advocates that nothing good could ever come out of Nazareth or Galilee and that a prophet shouldn't come there, come from there. But I want to recount a prophecy found in the book of Isaiah chapter 9. In Isaiah chapter 9, it's a familiar phrase that uh, is quoted in the New Testament in a few places, but in Isaiah 9, in verse 1 and in verse 2, it goes like this. Nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed, as when at first he lightly esteemed the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterward more heavily, uh, heavily oppressed her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in Galilee of the Gentiles. So this is just giving us a framework of where this is going to be taking place in the land of Zebulun, in the land of Galilee, which is the same region. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. And those who dwell in the land of shadow of death, upon them light has shined. The very accusation that these Pharisees were saying that no prophet has ever come from the land of Galilee, this prophet was to come. Not just a prophet, but the Son of God. And he had a very specific message, a message of light, of life, that he was to shine into this darkened region that was enshrouded in tradition, that was enshrouded in popular opinions, that had tainted what the scriptures had said. And Jesus had come to express to them that light from of old, quoted in Isaiah. That light that was to shine in a dark place. And this story right here in John chapter 8, it is an expression of that light that was to shine forth. Because going back to John chapter 8, it says in verse 11, Neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. This isn't the type of God that Israel had assumed or grown accustomed to. They believed God was in a God that was exacting, that was punishing, that if he stepped out of line, you would be um, put back in line in, 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 uh, in, in uh, uh, uncomfortable terms. But it says here, then Jesus spoke to them again in verse 12 saying, I am the light of the world and he who follows me shall not walk in darkness but have the light of life. Jesus came to reveal that light that had been cloaked in darkness for centuries and that light was the character of God to be revealed. Going back to the book of jo first uh, chapter of John, John chapter 1 and it says there in verse 4, in him, that is in Jesus, was life. And, in, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. 
And I think this is amazing, is that Jesus came to shine into this dark region, the region that prided themselves that they had the oracles of God, that they had the scriptures, that they had the most profound knowledge and truth of God, yet they were described as a dark place, void of God. And it says that they did not comprehend the light and that they ignored Christ. But that didn't cause Jesus to say, you know what, I'll stop shining but he continued to shine there. He continued to work patiently and fervently, and many hearts were touched because of it. And as a result, you and I are here to this day because of the gospel that was presented through Christ's life. This story, it reveals the light of God to humanity that God is uncompromising in his view towards sin, isn't he? It's just as this woman, he said to her, oh, it's okay, go ahead and continue sinning, I'll forgive you anyways. But no, he says, go and sin no more. Yet, being uncompromising in his view towards sin, he was still unquenchable in his love towards this sinful woman. And God was wanting to express this light, this love, this character to the world. Yet the Pharisees were unwilling to receive it. Back in the 4th century, there was a man by the name of Damon and his friend was Pythias. And they were great friends. They grew up together. They did everything together. But Pythias had grown to be a spokesman of uh, speaking out against the tyranny of the time, the emperor of the time that was um, very wicked and unjust in his ruling. And Pythias, you might say, put his foot in his mouth and he was thrown into prison and was actually sentenced to death because of speaking out against the tyranny of the emperor. Now, Pythias had one last request before he was to be sentenced to death. He says, let me travel home. Let me say goodbye to my wife and my children and make things right, and then I will come back and I will take my penalty. And the emperor says, how can I know that you will come back? And his good friend Damon, now, I'm not sure if you would do this, but his good friend Damon says, listen, I will stand in his place, that if he does not come back, I will die in his place. And the emperor said, okay just to see what would happen, and he lets Pythias go, and Damon is thrown into prison. And as the days go by, the deal was that if Pythias did not get back at the exact time of the execution, Damon would be killed. The days were growing closer and closer until finally was the day, and they began to tie Damon's hands and his feet. And they were about to execute him, and they were chiding him. They're saying, you fool, why did you let your friend go? You know he's not going to come back. And at the last moment and at the last second, Pythias stumbles in. He's beaten, he's ragged, he's torn, and he says, thank the heavens that Damon, you are okay. He says, my ship, it shipwrecked, it, it crashed, and on the road here I was mugged by robbers. And I'm so glad that I got back in time to die <laughs> and to set Damon free. And the emperor was so impressed by the love that was shown from both parties in this friendship that he says, I want to learn that love too. And he set them both free. You know, friends, we can stand up here week after week and we can recount the stories of God's love and expressed undeniably, unquenchably, and magnificently expressed in the scripture. And we need that. But what God is needing for his church to express that out there. He's needing friends like Damon and Pythias to express that love that is outside of this world. Needing 
for us to step outside of our comfort zones, needing us to step outside even of our time schedules and when it might be inconvenient or inconvenient to express that love to people. And just as it transformed this woman in John chapter 8, I believe that if we can not only hear it, but live that love to the people around us, it can bring transformation into their lives too. So my prayer this morning and the burden in my heart is that Christ would shine his light, his love through me. And that whether I'm at the cash register or whether I'm in the entry of the church or whether I'm walking past KFC, that God's love would shine through me. And I pray that it could be your prayer this morning too, that we would have that love like Damon and like Pythias and that we would care for one another inside as well as outside of this building. Amen? So in closing, we're going to sing Great is Thy Faithfulness and we'll invite our uh, musician to come forward and we'll play. We'll sing this great old hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness.